Last week on the show, we had Gavin Newsom. And when I asked Newsom if there was one thing that could solve everything, make government uh, fairer in the 21st century, he said that thing was the cloud. This week, we're going to have a very different view of the cloud. Uh, I've got Matt Richtel, who is a distinguished New York Times journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning author, journalist, and the author of a new book. He writes popular fiction. The Cloud. Matt, welcome to TechCrunch TV. That's not a fair uh, opening because Gavin is so much more, should I say Mayor Newsom or Lieutenant Governor Newsom is so much popular, more popular than I am. You've put me behind the eight ball. He's taller than you too. He, hey, that is, you're coming out swinging. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, <laughs> if, if Gavin was here Wait. dwarfing both of All us. All right, go ahead. What would you say to him? when he says that the cloud is the solution to all our woes? Well, first I'd say you've done some fine things, sir. Uh, second, I would I'd, I'd honestly say it sounds a little glib to me. Um, but And then on a more substantive level, the cloud's a complicated place. I mean, your viewers know that. So to call it a solution to anything is probably oversimplistic. But this book that you've come out with, a fantastic read, exciting, scary, you're saying that the cloud is deeply problematic. I'm saying that there are big issues with technology today, including the cloud, um, in the way that technology has enveloped us so completely. We're, we're so steeped in it in the Bay Area that we may not realize just how fast the onslaught has happened. I mean, smartphones, how, how, how old are smartphones? Five years, three years? What do you think? Well, mine is two years old. Two years old. You can make the case that it has come into our lives faster than any other technology, and then having come into our lives is now expanding at an extraordinary rate in terms of its capabilities. And what does that mean? I think the research will show that at the very least, it will show that it is affecting us and that we are connecting to it in ways we may not realize, neurologically, behaviorally, psychologically. You use the word envelop and technology together. What does it mean though, and, 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 and this book is a, is, is a wonderful voyage in this, in, in how one gets enveloped in the cloud. How does the cloud envelop us? Yeah, well in this case the, the, um, the title has a couple of meanings. One is the cloud, that big data storage place if you will. The other is the cloud that is enveloping the protagonist who is in a terrible emotional state as he tries to discover what's happening. And finally, the way I, to answer your question more directly, this story starts in Menlo Park where a young girl, something happens to her. And the investigator has to determine what that is. And only later does he realize she's been enveloped by this cloud, by which I mean, in effect, her brain has been hijacked. That the choices that she thinks she's making may not be her choices, that her relationship to computers and our relationship to our computers may in fact be dictating our choices in a way that suggests the free will isn't what we imagine. Matt, your day job, as I said, is as a New York Times reporter, and of course, especially for the New York Times, your work is... What, was Gavin that articulate? No, he was... He was, <laughs> he was he was taller than you. Uh, uh, Touche. Um, you, now you've interrupted. I, I can't remember what I was saying. So, so, you, so, you, so you write nonfiction yep. in your day job. Yep. And yet there was some real passion there about how technology was impacting us. You've written for the New York Times. You're, you won a Pulitzer Prize for your work on how technology was impacting on dangerous driving. But why have you turned to fiction? Why not write nonfiction? Well... I, I am also, and, and I just want to go back to your first point, if I might, about the passion about tech, technology in our lives. By no means do I think it's all bad or good. In fact, as a journalist, I often move away from those words because I think they're overly broad. I do think my charge as a journalist is to look for places where either we haven't thought about issues or the logic doesn't quite add up. That's the journalistic side. Makes sense? Can I turn to the fiction side? Why fiction? Two reasons. One, I love the idea that fiction allows us to take our world and almost, it's not exactly the right word, but satirize it. 
Go to the next level. Ask what if in a way that the precepts of the New York Times, and I swear by them, they are terrific ethics, would never allow. There's another reason which is entirely different and very personal to my own tastes. I love telling stories. I love to get engaged as a reader, as a viewer of movies in great tales. I try to create them, and I hope to create them for viewers, at least uh, readers, excuse me, and that's something that fiction permits much more than nonfiction. We've got a big audience of people really into technology. A lot of them aren't reading fiction. Why should they? Well, I, have a gr I think I have an answer to that personally for me. And uh, may I tell you, in, will you indulge a short story? Absolutely. We've had some really tough times at the New York Times lately. We've had some buyouts. It's no mystery to your um, viewers. The paper still attention. exists, does it? Cute. You know, I'm not that much shorter than this you. This is tech crime. <laughs> <laughs> Soon to buy the New York Times. No, look, we're going through what a lot of places have gone through. And in the last two weeks, it's been pretty emotional for me, honestly. And I've questioned the value of the story. What is a story? What is its value today? Why should we do it? And one day, I went and I played hooky because I was pretty distraught over these changes. And I You went, mean the, the layoffs and the... Stuff. Yeah, layoffs and management changes and friends leaving. And, you know, we're okay. We're, we're rationalizing our cost structure like everybody else. But it was hard on me and like everyone else. And I went and I played hooky and I went to Lincoln. And I was pretty emotionally, um, you know, hit up by the time I got there. And by the time, when that movie started, I had tears in my eyes. And by the time Sally Field went to her knees, I was sobbing. And two and a half hours, I'm leading somewhere, Andrew. Two and a half hour, hours later, I was just drained and felt better than I'd felt in two weeks. And I want to say two things about why I think that is. One, I think great writing and great storytelling is something I desperately crave and I think others do because I think it gives us a perch, a landing place when we're all, our heads are on a swivel and we're running from place to place. And I think the mediocre story is in trouble even the good story and good storyteller is dead, but I think the great story and great storyteller are more important than they've ever been. Your work is dark, though. How pessimistic are you about the technological future? You know, the, the reality is I'm quite optimistic. I think if it's You just dark, said that in, in front of millions of people. <laughs> How can you get away with, with these dark books? <laughs> well, I, I, would say, I would say that this book actually ends on a, a quite an optimistic turn, but, but your point's taken. They're dark in the sense, and this one is in particular, in the sense that I'm dealing with some really intense, emotional, character-driven things. And I would distinguish those from the technology things. Here's the broad point about optimism. I think our world is heading very broadly in the right direction. We've done all kinds of things with civil rights, with the end of fiefdoms and the rise of democracy. I think we are learning. We are evolving. Our memes are evolving just like our genes evolve, and your audience you know, gets all that. The question is, what do we do with these tools we've been given? My impression is, over time, the human species, if you will, we use our tools for good, but I think we use them for good when we pay attention to what they really are. And that's some of what I write about is trying to elucidate that. Seems to me that a lot of your work is dealing with how we remain human in the digital age. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, and, and what is it? And you have a very clear sense of what it means to be human and what it will mean to be human. I mean, your book is about how we're kind of undermined as human beings, potentially by technology, and how we fight back and reinvent ourselves. I think we're constantly reinventing ourselves. One of the things that is really interesting to me these days is that I think technology is telling us more about what it means to be human and who we really are than we've ever known. May I give you one more quick anecdote along you these lines? You don't need my, even if I said no, you'd still say it. So well, it, it's a good one. It's about pornography. Okay. Great trial happened a few years ago right. in Florida. It was an obscenity trial. In obscenity trials, the standard is a community standard, meaning they impanel the 12 jurors, and the 12 jurors sit there, and they say, well, what Joe Smith did selling that pornography on the corner violated the community standard. And this First Amendment lawyer for a guy accused of selling pornography did something extraordinary. He went to Google Trends, and he said, Okay, jury, you say this is against the community standard. 
But guess what? In this place, in Florida, more people are looking up orgy than are looking up apple pie. It was a tremendous mirror into who we are. So I appreciate you giving me credit or giving me probably more credit than I deserve about understanding humans. But what I think I do understand or appreciate at least is through our searches, through our behavior, through our use of language, all things we can measure through big data, we're seeing who we are in a way that was never before possible. I'm, I'm thrilled. In fact, my next book coming out next year called The Peace Machine is predicated on that very thing. I'm thrilled to find out who we are. Well, that ties the connection back to Gavin Newsom. Not that I have Gavin Newsom on, on the brain. He wrote a Man book about... crush. <laughs> Thank you. He wrote a book about how technology is reinventing government. And it seems to me that you're a writer about how technology is reinventing human beings. Matt Richtel, the author of The Cloud, if not a bestseller, soon to be a bestseller. Thank you so much for appearing on TechCrunch TV. And next time we'll do this standing up.